everybody, this is Dr. Jackie Jung. Today we will be talk about a little bit different thing. I know we covered it before, how to, uh, why family and friends, talking to family and friends cannot replace therapy. So today uh, we sh we're going to discuss something similar to that one. It's in the topic of how to choose a therapist. So when you were you know, thinking about it and prepare uh, for your therapy, and now the next step is the action, how you're going to uh, do your best to pick a therapist. So I'm going to start uh, this conversation, and then uh, Megan and Mitch, you know, can cover other areas. They have, we have different points. Uh, my point is focused mainly on the effective outcome uh, of uh, therapy uh, from this angle. So people come to therapy, they want to be helped, they want their problem to be solved. That's the main goal, in my opinion. So how uh, choosing a therapist would help uh, a person to, to reach their goal when they come to therapy session. So I will break it down to four different areas, and then I'll summarize. Uh, the four different areas, according to the research, are the main factors that would uh, lead to successful therapy. So people sometimes ask me, you know, how talking to people would just talking to somebody, uh, would, it, would it be different to them than talking to family or friends is just talking. But, you know, from the training, from our background, talking this itself, talking actually is a therapeutic, it's not just chatting like we normally do. So the main, there are four different factors in effective therapy. The first one is um, a client, they call it client factor, which contributes to 40% of the successfulness of the therapy. Um, the so-called client factor is about yourself, you know, what stages you are right now in your life. Uh, are you just uh, thinking about doing therapy? Are you already in action? You, you know, Google it, searching it, looking for, for a good therapist around in this area? Um, or are you, uh, right now really don't think it's necessary at this point for the so these factors cannot be controlled or determined by the therapist it has to be you know from clients factor how prepared a client to come in walking into the therapy office that contribute to uh, how successful the therapy uh, would be um, and also you know for clients that are court ordered you know how ready you are actually getting to the therapy that that is the factor that a therapist cannot control. I mean, some clients really don't want to be here, especially court ordered. They just sit here. They really don't get out of much from uh, therapy sessions. Uh, so in that way, you know, it probably is not going to lead to a positive outcome. You know, some teenagers would be, um, you know, way forced by their parents to, you know, you, you need to be fixed. The therapist needs to fix you. And they really don't want to be there. And I've had teenagers sitting in my session the whole time and not speaking a word, <laughs> talking about from, you know, oppositional defiance. So uh, <laughs> in that way, they really, it's it's the time there they spend there sitting there not really producing much enough for therapy work. And these factors, uh, I would I would explain um, therapists that can promote some type of participation, but uh, mainly it's from the client. Um, Point. You know, that's the 40% client factor. Um, and also there are some factors, you know, uh, some clients uh, would bring in that a, a therapist would not know, such as the beliefs, biases, virtues, you know. Are you, do you feel more comfortable talking to a female, male? What uh, ethnicity you feel comfortable? Uh, these things cannot be controlled by therapists. It has to be what the client choose to be comfortable with. You know, another example would be grieving. You know, I had... Um, uh, some clients that uh, lost their spouses, you know, they come for grief, grief therapy. Uh, maybe they feel I'm too young. Uh, maybe they feel some other way, you know, uh, during that time. So the connection was was not there. And it's nobody's fault. It's just the clients probably prefer an older therapist um, uh, in that aspect. The second one, that is a therapeutic alliance. Uh, that is something that can be created and controlled a lot by the therapist. And I think that's very important. Although it's only 30%, I think that's more than 30%. The so-called therapeutic alliance is relationship. You can title it therapeutic alliance, therapeutic um, uh, relationship. Rapport. Rapport, yeah, rapport. Um, and the, the difference between an experienced therapist
therapist or their inexperienced therapist, they did the research on that. It's not about their theoretical background. It's not about uh, their uh, you know, behavior therapy or cognitive behavior therapy, client-centered therapist. It's not about theoretical approach. It's mainly about their uh, ability to establish therapeutic alliance, which means uh, an experienced therapist uh, has, uh, is capable now to uh, establish better therapeutic alliance with their uh, clients or easier for them to establish, make them feel welcomed, you know, trust, trusting those way. Um, also, you know, as Megan said, the rapport, rapport in a way is trust, is about how much you trust uh, of your therapist. And that this type of trust can be created by your therapist. Um, and create the environment that you feel is very trusting. Uh, relationship heal, I have another point here, it says relationship heal. Um, and that's a crucial factor for the rapport, for the therapeutic alliance. A lot of uh, clients outside of the office, they really didn't have many significant uh, positive experiences. Uh, So-called the non-positive experience is about relationships. You think about it, whether with your boss, the coworkers, students, uh, um, parents, uh, those are all relationships. So the point of the therapy is to establish a positive relationship with your therapist so that you utilize the skill outside of your therapy room. And the third point that it would, or third factor contribute to successful uh, therapy is, they call it placebo effect or hope, either way. And this can be contributed in uh, by both therapist and the client, which means uh, uh, you want to go to a therapy session with a therapist that actually would e establish hope in you uh, and that themselves personally believe a therapy works. You don't want to go to a therapist that <laughs> the therapist thinks that, oh, I'm just here for the time. You know, I don't really think that they could ever change uh, why I'm doing this. You don't want a therapy like that. You know, I don't think most therapists are like that. Most therapists believe therapeutic work would uh, produce positive outcomes. Clients. That's why they're doing their job. So this placebo is about 15% uh, contribution to the successfulness of uh, positive outcome. And the last one is technique. And that technique I'm talking about uh, is on therapists um, on our end, is what kind of a technique you will use. For example, uh, there are different techniques, you know, uh, Mitch probably can tell you more. Um, uh, there was the theories that produce these techniques, so-called the client-centered therapy, the Rogerium technique. Uh, these techniques are not used, research is suggested are not effective in treating uh, problematic behavior issues uh, teenagers, which means, you know, Rogerium, you just uh, kind of repeat, give them feedback and uh, uh, repeat what they said. It's um, unconditional regard. And the one, uh, teenager have behavior issues, uh, research suggests an effective way would it be behavior therapy, play therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, and reality theory, which is what you can control in your behavior. These already established so-called evidence-based uh, practice is effective in treating oppositional defiance or delinquent you know, behavior. Um, but uh, other theories would be better, like uh, for EMDR, would it be good for trauma? Uh, you know, uh, DBT would be good for borderline personality disorder. So there are different techniques the therapist could use. I mean, there's some gestalt will be good to promote the self-awareness. Uh, so these techniques, uh, the therapist uh, should, you know, utilize when they treat certain group of uh, clients. And of course, you know, they are not going to tell you, they're just going to utilize, utilize these techniques in session. Uh, so when you are selecting a therapist, you want to kind of, um, do some research on their background, what's the theory, you know, what their specialty is, expertise. Uh, those things are good questions to ask about them. Okay, and I'm you know, summarize my uh, my whole point with all this research, all this data. Um, I, I want to summarize it for for a person that just want to find a good fit, a good therapist. So I'll simplize it. Uh, I'll give you just three points. You know, a therapist you like a therapist that you trust, and a therapist you perceive as a competent. You perceive as a competent, okay? Uh, so I think that these three that will cover all these points that I've made just now. Uh, therapist you like, 
your trust and you proceed as a conflict. Okay. That's summarizing my speech. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I can piggyback off okay. of where Jackie kind of ended. She talked a lot about having a positive relationship, the therapeutic alliance, and some components that would go into that, like she mentioned, is you know definitely the trust. <clears throat> and having a therapist that you feel comfortable with. Is the environment that you're in with them comfortable? Do you feel safe there? Is it non-judgmental? Can you relate to your therapist? Um, are they easy to talk to? And when, when you look at relating with a client or as the client to your therapist, sometimes people will come in and say, I've had this very unique experience and I don't think that my therapist or any therapist would be able to understand me or what I've gone through. And sometimes they are correct in the, in the sense of we don't have the same shared experiences but we're all human and we all experience the same range of emotions. So if someone comes in and they describe an experience, but we can identify underneath, they felt betrayed. I might have an example or a time where I felt betrayed, so it's still a, I'm still able to connect based on that shared ex, um, emotional experience, which can be um, a very positive way to relate, even if a client has a very different background or very different life experiences as their therapist. Uh, another thing that's really important is that the therapist provides a lot of support to a client, but in addition to the support that a client receives from their therapist, a therapist, part of their job is to also help a client increase the supports or their support network that they have outside of session. Because uh, you know the goal is not to be in therapy forever, the goal is to help bring in support and help a client learn how to utilize the things that they're using in session, the skills, um, outside of session and, and become more independent in their ability to manage their own um, concerns and factors that come up in their life and build positive relationships and supports outside of session so that they can be more and more independent. Um, my second section is about collaborative care and um, sometimes when working with a client things may came may come up that I don't necessarily have a lot of expertise on or it's not um, you know something that I specialize in and it doesn't necessarily mean that I can't still be effective in working with a person but there are times where it becomes important to consult research collaborate with others to try to find more information that might help that particular client including referring them to others if people are coming in with um, medical health related concerns, I might refer them to their family doctor or you know, encourage them to seek out a specialist for that particular need or a, um, a sleep study, for example. Also medication, um, within our office here, we don't have anyone that can prescribe medication. That would need to be from a psychiatrist or some family doctors or nurse practitioners can do that. And so if somebody has a need for medication, then I would refer out for that. Um, also, sometimes um, intensive substance abuse treatment might be needed that I would refer out for um, and, and other types of things might come up that I would refer out or another therapist might refer out for. Right. Well, we can refer to each other. Like if you need a testing, psychological oh, testing yes. done, then I can. Or, you know, you need a niche in some other like a trauma treatment and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, then you can take over the case to refer within the office yes. as well. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, my third section is about um, other people participating in sessions. So a lot of my work is is one-on-one -on -one individual sessions with clients. I do work a lot with children or anyone under the age of 18. And especially with young children, it's really, really important to include parents in their therapy sessions, um, either part of the time or for a large chunk of the time, depending on the age and the particular needs of clients. I have had clients as young as three and you know there's only so much that I can do directly working with a three-year-old to try to teach you know skills or emotional regulation it's really important to have the parent present and involved so that they are learning right along with their child um, you know what those skills are that are being taught so the parent or guardian can help implement those at home or outside of sessions um, in addition to parents being involved in sessions, other examples might be uh, if a, an adult individual is, is um, 
newly diagnosed with something, you might have a spouse come in to have the therapist help educate both parties on what that diagnosis is, what it might mean for them as a couple or as a family, and also to provide extra skills on you know, how to kind of navigate or manage some of those symptoms. The other last point that I want to make is it's, it's important for a therapist to ask clients about what their home environment is like outside of sessions because if they are coming from a place of a, a, you know, a negative environment or having a lot of negative relationships or experiences, if they are trying to work on themselves and, and make these positive changes, it's helpful if the environment that they're returning to is also supportive of those changes that they're that the client is trying to make. I, not as a therapist, but I used to work um, heavily with youth that were in residential treatment centers. And oftentimes, you know, they would start making quite a lot of progress in building up new skills and trying to just have a healthier lifestyle. But often what would happen is they would discharge from the programs, go back into homes where there was abuse or really strained parent relationships or drugs and alcohol present, etc and they often would end up coming back into treatment or getting into more trouble because those changes that they tried to make, that healthier lifestyle, wasn't supported in the home. So that is something that's really important to um, talk about with clients and to help them recognize in what ways they can maybe eliminate some of that negativity that is present in their life or relationships and perhaps promote um, more support from others that are involved with them. Yeah. Right, that reminds me of like this, this like a substance abuse treatment program, mm -hmm. the 28 days. You go, went there, you got treated, and you get better, clean, sober, and then you came back. And okay, I'm just gonna cover a few things that maybe weren't covered or go into a little side perspective on a few things. Um, in terms of what a person should consider when choosing a therapist, there are Lots of therapists in most cities um, were pretty common. And sometimes I believe therapists just kind of, you know, I mean, clients kind of randomly pick a therapist and just hope it works out okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, and sometimes you kind of have to do that because some therapists, in, including us, we, we don't have a particular like this is our opening interview and it's free and you can ask me anything you want. All of that has to be done up front with the person that they're talking to to make the appointment if you have questions. You would ask them if they didn't know the answer then they would check with one of us. Um, I want to talk about qualifications though. There are different qualifications for being a therapist and one of the things that I find again and again is that general public doesn't know the difference between different types of therapists. For instance, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. That means I have a bachelor's degree in a area of interest that is related to psychology or counseling. In my case, it's a bachelor's degree in religion, which is a little different. Um, then the second educational requirement is a master's degree in counseling psychology, counseling, uh, those types of things will qualify a person then to take uh, two tests we have to take and have to have 2,000 hours of supervised experience and then we get our license. And the important thing about getting a licensed therapist is you know you're getting someone who has the training. They had to jump through a lot of hoops to get that license and it's important that when you're choosing a therapist you find someone who has a lot has been licensed and is licensed and can better provide for your needs now Megan's qualifications are a little different than mine Jackie's are a little different yet and I've asked each of them just to share briefly what their qualifications are my license is a licensed clinical social worker. So similar to Mitch, I had six years of post high school college experience. It started with a bachelor's degree. Mine in particular was in both psychology and social work. 
And then <clears throat> I went on two more years to get a master's degree, and I did that in a social work program. To have my specific degree, it has to be that the master's degree was specifically in social work. And similar mm -hmm. to Mitch, I also had so many hours that I, I did while being supervised and um, a couple different tests that um, helped me not just have my master of social work, but become a licensed master of social work. Um, and um, with the, the social work degree, the, the main way that I kind of describe it to people is that there's a little less emphasis put on the different modalities that Jackie was talking about, the specific types of intervention, and more emphasis focused on the rapport building, the relationship with the client, having a more broad perspective of understanding problems that clients are coming in with, really focusing on building up that, uh, like kind of the, that core, who that person is, how they feel about themselves, it's really heavy with um, empowerment and strengths-based types of perspectives. Right, the LCPC is more clinical driven, is more diagnosis driven. A uh, social worker is more, uh, what's a little bit like counseling, uh, what is the strength in an individual, you know, how we're going to promote the best quality. So my background is in psychology, although I had LCPC in the past uh, for about, I can't remember, until I had my psychologist license, but I've been in this field for about 15 years. Um, uh, I focus now, I only focus on uh, psychological testing or court order testing. Uh, the education background, I got a master's degree and two years supervised. I experienced like the LCPC, and during the meanwhile, I was doing my doctoral program as well. I did a pre-doc, pre intern, postdoc, intern, the postdoc, uh, two internships actually, practicum, comp, and residency, everything, uh, a, you know, uh, doctoral program um, would require, and, and the dissertation as well, so. Um, and also, with any therapist or psychologist that is licensed, there are ongoing requirements, continuing education yes. requirements to promote, you know, staying up with best, best practices, new interventions, things like that. There's a lot of oversight to ensure that if somebody is licensed, that they are continually a professional, competent individual. And ethical. Yeah. And, and Megan, that makes me think of you, you mentioned about the types of practice um, and I think it's important that clients know if their therapist uses evidence-based practices or not. Um, just very quickly, evidence-based practices are types of therapy that have been thoroughly researched, that have, the research results have been duplicated by peers, and the evidence shows that this particular type of therapy works. Right. And there are different types of therapy that, actually Jackie, you mentioned borderline right. personality disorder DBT, and yep. DBT. Yep. DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, you mentioned trauma with mm -hmm. EMDR and SI movement desensitization and reprocessing. I wouldn't expect someone in the general public to know right. all of those things. Right. Just the general idea, does your therapist use uh, techniques and theories that evidence shows work to help people get better. Um, right, also, or some other weird methodologies. Yes. That, <laughs> that's out there. Um, well, speaking of experience, the, the other question that's related to, to that is do they have experience in your areas of need? Um, for, for instance, I got a call from an insurance company wanting to know if I would take a client and when I talked to the insurance company about the presenting problem, they said it's a foot fetish. They get sexually aroused by feet. And I have absolutely no experience in treating fetishes. I have very little education in treating fetishes. So I had to say no, that I couldn't take that client. Now I could have said yes and just kind of tried to figure it out as I go. I could have done some research. Right. And maybe if there weren't any other therapists so, so, in the oh, area right. or I any other so. choices, you know, then and maybe that's what's going to have to be done. But it's important that, that as Megan said, um, you choose someone who, if you're having anxiety problems, they have uh, experience in treating anxiety, etc. cetera. Um, and then one other question they can, you, you should ask is, 
can the therapist accommodate your availability? And this is just a very practical thing. Right. Right. Um, for instance, I work four evenings a week, as I think Megan does as well, most weeks. Right. And um, I don't. I work five. You come in earlier than we right. do, though. Right. So, yeah. Eight thirty to five. Yep. Yeah. So um, the last thing I wanted to say was just um, piggybacking again. I'm piggybacked on everybody today. Um, but I did a research paper when I was in my master's program on the effectiveness of therapy versus the effectiveness of the Native American shaman. And huh? I came out with, with three conclusions from my research and that those three conclusions, um, well, that's one conclusion based on three things. The conclusion is that a shaman is often just as effective as a therapist. And in my research, it identified three things. One was, does the culture support what you're doing for healing? So, in, you know, in the Native American culture, they support going to the shaman. Right. Shaman. Right. Um, secondly, let's see, what's the second one? The second one is, does your immediate family and close friends support what you're doing? So do they believe in counseling? Do they believe in psychology? Are, are they, it kind of goes back to the supportive, yep. the yep. environment type so. thing. And then um, the last one is, does the client believe that the shaman or the therapist can help them? Yes, and if the client the believes, and, yep. then, oh. then it's beneficial. And so if those things are in place, then um, that's going to help the, the experience to be more rewarding, to be richer, and to um, be effective in helping people change their behaviors and feelings. I don't really have anything else today. Very good. Actually, we covered a large area and of um, you know, important aspects uh, of effective uh, therapist, therapy. What is effective therapy and how to choose a therapist? Um, I think uh, we did a good job, and um, if you like the video, give us your like, and if you have a question, leave comments below, or below this video, or call us and let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you. <sighs> this was like the hardest it's one. It's still going. Oh. What happened? Yeah, your side was a little premature. Aww. Yeah.